Howdy, howdy, howdy. This is Ryan Acid, it's Murphy, and I'm going to do a little uh, showcase on a game I'm working on right now called Jack Hoth and the Secret of the Philosopher's Goblet. Now, I was working on the adventure, or the quest of Jimmy the Nerd. I'm still working on that one periodically. It's just, I kind of get burnt on working on one project, so I'll work on other things. So, you know, I've got like three or four games i have working on in a kind of a rotation along with a book I've been writing. So that way I don't get burnt out on any one particular thing. I always have something I can be working on. So... This one came about because I was contacted to do some collaboration on a Jacksepticeye fan game from the one who was kind of the, the main force behind the boss. At least that's how I take it. Katie, I believe. Yeah. Is the one I've been in contact with. So, really what I'd mo mostly be able to contribute to a collaborative game like that is dialogue, which is fine, but the artist in me can't leave things at that. I need to be able to do my own thing. So I decided, you know what, I'm going to make a sequel to Jack Hoth and uh, do a potential tie-in to the, the new fan game. You know, whatever. You know, whatever happens with the collaboration, I'm gonna make this game regardless because I like some of the ideas I thought of uh, for it. So overall, the, the basic story to start with is something's going to happen. I'm not gonna say what exactly because it's a major plot point and it's kind of the start of the game and. I don't want to give any of that away. It's There's a couple of different plot points, and there's several po plot points that'll be carrying on through the game. Because I wanted to do, for this one, I wanted to kind of go back to my roots even more, because I really, I grew up with like the Super Nintendo and Nintendo era RPGs. So, this one's going to have more of that epic you know, kind of far-reaching world affecting political turmoil and upheaval sort of feel of some of those classic RPGs. So we're talking things like, you know, Final Fantasy and Zelda and uh, Earthbound and uh, Chrono Trigger, I think, was one of them. You know, there, there were loads of really, really, really good RPGs on the Super Nintendo. So I kind of wanted to go back and do something in, along those lines. So Jack Hoth is really a parody of a parody. It's just a balls-to-the-wall, wacky, Monty Python, Mel Brooks kind of crazy-ass comedy trip. With some other stuff that gets woven in the further you get into the game, obviously. And Jimmy the Nerd is going to be a horror comedy game. So I'm kind of working, for, for this particular setting at least, I'm kind of working my way through the various genres that I am most uh, familiar with and enjoy the most. So this one, I think my inspiration came a lot from buddy comedy movies, because over the holidays ended up watching Lethal Weapon and Die Hard 1 and 2 and then ended up watching the rest of the Lethal Weapon movies and Die Hard 3, and, uh, you know, so I just kind of got that into my head of kind of a buddy cop sort of movies and action thriller type movies with some co comedic elements. So that's kind of the, the tone I think this game is going to be going for. And at the beginning of the game, as I said, there's going to be an event that takes place right at the start of the game. And that's going to set some stuff in motion for the starters. Uh, my dude at the beginning of the game is locked up, along with his uh, comrade, Athera. 
they're going to be released by uh, the princess, the empress. You need to, you really need to play the first game because there are quite a few things that happen towards the end of that game that uh, some plot twists and whatnot that make things under more understandable leading into this one. If you don't play the first game, you might be a bit lost at the start of this one. Although I always try to make games so that you don't necessarily need to have any foreknowledge in order to play them and enjoy them. So most things will be reasonably explained through dialogue before you get too far into the game. So they get released and then they go and visit Jack. I make this a 1-1 one, one scale here. zoom out a little bit. So Jack is uh, back home in the past and they go and visit him and get him back involved with what's going on because uh, in the first game he uh, has some interactions that become significant with a side character called Essia, an ice elf maiden. All right, a young girl of the ice elf uh, race. And the basic plot other than, you know, there's quite going to be quite a few plot threads in this game, but the, the major one you start with is going, and that gets Jack back involved, is going to Jack Hoth. Remember, this is a par still a parody of the, the We Telly people, the YouTubers. It's all parody stuff. Alternate reality parody slash parody. So Essie's people are resistant to magic. And there is this war brewing between the kingdom, where the first game takes place in, and an adjoining kingdom, or empire. I haven't decided if I'm going to go with that particular cliche, where the empire is always evil or not. It, so far, I have just have it as another kingdom in all my notes and stuff I've been writing. But we'll see. Leave a comment if you have an opinion on that, whether you think the the evil empire should be the bad guy or it should just be another kingdom and kind of go against the trope, the cliché. But anyway, because Essia's people, the Ice Elves, are resistant to magic, they make really good soldiers in a magical conflict, so they are being enslaved for this purpose, along with other less, or even less uh, savory uh, things. You know, if you're going to tackle the issue, issue of enslavement, and which is kind of a, a thing about human trafficking in the modern world, and in this case I'm just transplanting the topic, there's always going to be issues that are very disturbing. Because slavery is a disturbing issue. And like I said, if you really want to get kind of that uh, thriller element in there. You can't avoid hard, you know, hard issues. So her people are being kidnapped, enslaved for soldiers and other things. And that's your first major plot, is to shut down this enslavement ring. So at the beginning of the game, you're going to start off in this woods area. Uh, the trio of Jack, Athera, and my dude you know, he's my guy in this reality, the version of me that exists in this reality, they're going to show up and join up with Essia, and there's going to be slavers trying to capture her because, uh, well, I haven't gotten that far. You know, she's an ice elf, so she's going to be useful for whatever nefarious desires they are, perpet are perpetrating. <laughs> So they're gonna, you're going to have to start the game trying to escape from the slavers. You're in the middle of the woods, so you're going to have to find your way out. So that's kind of the how the game's going to start. And I've been working on the, the woodland areas. Done quite a bit of work on just kind of the overall landscape here. Yeah, um, when it comes to the, the trees, they look blocky for now. But actually, they won't look like that when the game is made because uh, 
the tile sets I'm using, the first seed material, woods, and mines, I believe it's called something to that effect. It has this really nice trimming for all the the tree areas, and plus, after I'm done with all this, when there the, there may still be like little flat areas and jaggy areas I don't like. I'm also using a, a Yanfly plugin called the Grid Free Doodads. So what I'll be able to do is take some of these tree bits. And what the doodad plugin does is you actually bring up the game, you hit F10 while it's running, and then you can actually uh, place stuff on the map anywhere you want off the grid. It's it's a great plugin. I love it. It's great for doing just about anything, really. But uh, you know, especially for little things like this, is where it really shines the most because it's really great for doing like rooms so you can put stuff on tables and stuff that normally you would have a lot of harder of a time getting things to sit just right so it's really great for that but for me where it really shines is allowing you to do layering of stuff because you know this is all very uniform looking right here I'll be able to go through with some of these other uh, bits of leaf cover and stuff and I'll be able to create layers with that and I'll also do that with some parallax mapping I don't do a lot of that sort of stuff but this is where I do like to use it where otherwise things would look be very uniform I can make a paintbrush out of some of the tree material here and just kinda go through and then paint in some areas with the parallaxing and layer that on top of the tree so things are less uniform and blocky even less uniform and blocky so um, I'll be doing that throughout our first stuff all through the game I'm not a fan of parallax mapping I think it takes too long and and in the end the results really aren't any uh, vast they're not really that superior to what you get just using the in-game tile sets anyway. At least not if you've bought some nicer tile sets that have like the edging stuff on them. So I'm not a big fan of parallax mapping. You know, if that if you are and, and you have the, the skills to make it worth the time to do it, then by all means go ahead. But personally, I'm not going to spend ages and ages and ages to do something that in the end isn't really going to be any better than what I've already done here, like this stuff here, you know, it's not worth my time, it's, you know, it's more of a hassle than it's worth to me, but you do you, I'll do me, but I do like the parallax mapping for stuff like breaking up things like, you know, like the, the monotony the of the tree cover and that sort of stuff, so I will be doing that pretty much any time I have like trees or anything like that that's uh, really monotonous or just too uniform. And this one also has some nice stuff for the ponds. So you don't have to have the quite as blocky looking ponds. and other water sources. Which is nice. Yeah, that didn't work. That didn't look right either. Doesn't look right either. Well, I guess that's not really going to work. That doesn't really look 100% right either. But that's okay. And that is just ways to... No, that's not quite what I would want to do. There you go. You just kind of break up the 
the lines a bit, so it looks less... grid. A little more natural. Just, you know, you have a, if you get a really good tile set like this, you know, you can do all sorts of nice things like that. So, let's see. Go ahead and talk a little bit about, or can get into the back end stuff a little bit, I'll talk about it. So, we've got Jack is coming back, Essia. She's going to be looking kind of different, but she's been through an ordeal, which will be discussed. Athera, my dude, a Crescent Moon, who is going to, she makes an appearance in the Jack Hoth game. She's going to be a main character, or a playable character in Jimmy the Nerd. She's also going to be in this one. Aurora is in the first game, is a side character you talk with briefly. She's going to be a character in this game. The Empress slash Princess is going to be in here, along with some others. Uh, these are just the starting versions of Acid Heads and Aetheria when they're in the prison. Uh, I'm not going to worry about talking about skills too much uh, or items. I am going to have an upgrade system on this game so you can upgrade your weapons and armor instead of having a bunch of... Uh, instead of just having one set of weapons like Jack Hoth and Jimmy the Nerd. Jimmy the Nerd is only going to have one set of weapons for each character. This one I wanted to do something a little different, so I'm using the up Yanfly. I always use the Yanfly's plugins, and the only time I use somebody else's stuff is if there's something that Yanfly hasn't made a plugin for yet. Otherwise, Yanfly all the way. So there's going to be a few things like um, Athera's knives, Gagax, and my Zai are going to actually level up with her. So is Sigilda, the Blade Staff, which is my dude's weapon. They will; those weapons will be leveling up with them. While like Jack will be using daggers once again, so he'll have a dagger, heavy dagger, Rondel, dagger, knightly dagger, Dirk, base lord, Kukri, Tonto, Pesh Kabaz. Cobbs and Qatar. A Qatar is a uh, punch blade. And I'm I'm gonna be adjusting all the parameters and stuff. There's gonna be some swords in here. I'm not sure. I'll probably have the, the princess slash empress using the swords. Um So uh, just generally speaking they're going to have a set type of weapon they'll be able to use. I'm working on some other games where characters will basically be able to use whatever you want them to use. A lot more customization for that, but I didn't want to get too crazy on customization for this game. And then take it too far away from the original, from the Jack Hoth game, the first one. So you're still going to have a set type of weapon you'll be using, but you'll be able to use uh, items to upgrade. Like uh, the oil of strength adds plus 10 strength. And that'll th those are upgrades. I haven't... There, Yanfly has two up, uh, upgrade type plugins. There's upgrades and then augments. I've only done uh, upgrade things, so... And each weapon will only be able to support one upgrade. So, you might get an oil of bare strength, which gives you an attack plus 30. Or in this case, it'll be strength plus 30. And there's different ones for all of those. And then the augments will do 
a variety of different effects, and you can have multiple augments depending on what the weapon or armor type is. Armor's going to be similar. Uh, I need to change some stuff in here. I still have the same basic assortment of armors, because I just like this system. Uh, instead of, like, having a whole bunch of weird named armors and stuff, you're going to be able to have... There's a set type, or different types of actual armors that really existed. Different kinds of shields, and then there's uh, an assortment of different robes for the magic characters. Uh, helmets and caps, head guards, and then some different kinds of thing, ring, necklace, belt boots, bracelet, earrings, gloves are going to be your uh, accessory types. Although you actually can equip a ring, a neck. I'm going to probably make it where you can put on two rings, but I'm not sure about that yet. I need to crunch some numbers for statistic for uh, parameters and stuff so I can get my... Because I'm going to be using leveling enemies, which is something I'm bringing in from Jimmy the Nerd. So in order to do that properly, I need to make sure my... At least to start with, get my numbers as close as I can to being what I think they should be. You know, a little bit of math to start with goes a long way when it comes to balancing your game when it comes for combat. So you'll be able to have... Uh, ring, necklace, belt, boots, bracelet, earring, and gloves. As I said, and all of those intrinsically, in and of themselves, they won't actually give you any kind of benefit. Like the gold ring doesn't give you anything, but it allows you to add a mark onto it. Or the necklace is a glyph, the belt is a rune, uh, the leather boots or armor. The armor boots actually give you a little bit of... the boots actually do benefit you just a little bit, but you'll be able to put a glyph on the boots, a fetish. Get your head out of the gutter. A fetish is a magical item in a cult, in certain cultures. They're called, that's where the word came from. Earrings, a talisman, gloves, a glyph as well. And gloves can also... the armor gloves can add a little bit of defense while removing some magic attack which is how I always set up my ar different kinds of armor. There are pluses and minuses. So you'll be able to get a variety of different upgrades. So you won't have to go searching for ages and ages to find the perfect gold ring, or white gold ring for the upgraded version. Because the white gold ring can use a rune and a mark instead of just a mark. So you won't have to go searching for the, the just the right one for the character you're trying to get the item for. All you'll have to do is find the right mark, or rune and mark, for the better ring. And the same goes for all of the stuff. For like a full leather armor, you can put a rune on it. Well, then there's also going to be fine leather are fine versions of the armor, so fine full leather armor, you can put a rune in a glyph. And then superb full leather armor, rune, glyph, and a mark. Plus one upgrade. So you'll be able to trick out your gear as you see fit. It's going to be expensive, but I'm going to try to make money uh, available enough in the game to get you there. So, uh, Jimmy the Nerd, I'm also bringing in a few other the combat things. I'm going to bring in the row formations, so you'll have three different rows with different effects. Um, you're going to have the party gauge that will fill up over the course of the battles, and different uh, skills will use that instead of... or instead of or in addition to your usual like skill points, magic points. Some skills will be limited use per battle, so you may only be able to use it one time in a battle. Or they'll, they might have cooldowns, so you'll have to wait a, period, a number of turns before you can use them again. 
Um, I'm going to have elemental stuff for combat, including elemental enemies, enemies that are going to either be completely immune to certain elements or even be healed by them. I'm using my four different types of physical damage, sledging, penetrating, cutting, and cleaving elements, basically, so different kinds of armor will defend better against certain kinds of damage, which will also be reflected on enemies by giving them the same uh, element rates in their traits. I made a rhyme. Ha ha ha. And also the same parameters. Basically, if I go in and decide, okay, this enemy is going to have access to this kind of gear, I'm going to adjust their stats a little bit to reflect that, as I need to. So, combat should be quite uh, engaging, and currently I have a list of over 260 enemies. Each, you know, there's going to be like elemental versions of different enemies, like slimes and stuff, different versions of those, and elemental spirits and stuff. But still, like 260 some enemies. And then on top of that, I'm also bringing in the the uh, gradients, the, the grades of enemies, the ranks of enemies from Jimmy the Nerd, because I really like that system. And I wanted and decided I was going to go ahead and introduce it with this game because I, I really do like it. I thought it was a pretty good. Uh, I'm sure I'm not the first person to do something like this in a in an RPG Maker game, but if I am, all all is cool. That's cool. So you're gonna have different H or hit point bar colors to tell you what type of enemy you're up against. I'm not gonna talk about that too much right now. Basically, you're going to have uh, a, B, C, D, E level enemies, which is something that's already kind of in the game, or in the software, but then you're also going to have Alpha, Alpha 2, Alpha 3, Omega, Omega 2, Omega 3, and Omega 4 level enemies. So there's going to be a range of different types of enemies, like uh, one of the the bosses, the really big, powerful bosses, will be Omega-level enemies. Minor bosses, mini-bosses, will be Alpha-level enemies, or just powerful. Um, like if you're up against a bunch of soldiers and one of them's a captain, the soldiers might be A and B level, but the captain would probably be an Alpha-level enemy. And I'm not telling you all of my... Uh, how I'm figuring all this stuff out, but basically each level rank of enemy will have different uh, types of stats. You know, the better or the higher the level, the more powerful the stat arrangement will be. And then, of course, like I said, you'll have HP bars that will reflect the, the class of the enemy. So there, there'll be some randomization there on what level of enemy you'll get. So not only are you going to have like 260 some uh, unique, or at least uh, mostly unique enemies. Well, you know, even the ones like the elemental slimes and stuff, they will have their unique attributes based around their elements. So 260 some unique enemies. Plus, you also have grades of enemies for, you know, the, the, the regular enemies, whatever you want to call them, the mobs, basically. Bosses will always have a fixed uh, level or grade, but mobs will come in varying flavors, basically. And I've already started working out... Uh, what the highest level an enemy will be found at will be. So, by the time all that's said and done, there will probably be somewhere in the neighborhood of a thousand enemies, maybe. I don't know if I want to go that crazy with it, but with 260-some enemies to base, plus all the, the, the grades that I'll be working in, there will be a lot of variety to the enemies. 
uh, that you'll be facing by the time all is said and done. Plus, w with some other randomization you'll encounter, they'll have different kinds of weapons. And different uh, levels of gear. So, so yeah, the enemies. There will be quite a lot of variety to the enemies, and things will be will change up fairly often. You'll have to really kind of work your. You know, you'll have to feel out the enemies. There's going to be a lot of mechanics that'll be used. Easy to understand, hard to master is kind of my philosophy when it comes to combat. I want it to be easy to get into and start playing, but then when, you know, the the more advanced into the game you get, the further into the game you get, the more advanced the combat becomes, basically. So, you know, combat should be pretty good when all is when all, when it's all done. We're going to have a variety of states. I'm not going to take time going over all that. So, yeah, I think that covers all the basic stuff, all the important stuff for this. So, so yeah, I think that that's pretty much everything. I mean, Jack's going to have a bit of a new look. As I said, Essia's got a new look. Athera and I, my dude, kind of has a new look. Well, this is more li like how he looks in Jimmy the Nerd, a Crescent Moon. You know, everybody's going to be in there, all, all these characters. I I don't think I'm going to bring in any of the other YouTubers, the parody versions of them. Because I kind of wanted this to be... different. You know, the first one, like I said, was very balls-to-the-wall parody, Mel Brooks... Monty Python, Austin Powers, kind of a parody game. This one is more the buddy cop comedy thriller sort of mixture going on with uh, probably a lot of the, the tension will come from Jack and Acid Heads. My dude is going to be one of the main party members. I'm not doing that for my own gratification. It just made the most sense as a sequel. And you'll understand why, because, you know, you play the first game, the end of the first game, it doesn't actually say why or that he is going... You'll find out why he gets locked up, but you don't find out that he is going to be locked up, but it is a natural progression that my dude and his one remaining... Uh, major comrade that was assisting him in the first game are both going to be locked up and then they have to kind of redeem themselves in this game to a degree. You know, as much as they can, you know. So that's going to be one of the side plots of this game. Um, other things like the side view battlers, I'm going to be doing some customization. I've done I did that a little bit already for Jimmy the Nerd. That one's gonna have some customization for the, the battlers as well for the side view guys. So I'm gonna be doing some stuff there. Like the normal motion for getting ready to cast a spell is like this chanting thing right here. I'm gonna change that for the for my dude because that's not really his style. Same for Athera. You know, everybody's going to get some some mild customization when it comes to their side view battle or things. You see equipment down here. Going to be a good sized equipment list. <coughs> so pardon me. Uh, so yeah, there's going to be a lot of work going into this. It's going to be a long game. Like I said, I want to go for that kind of epic... Uh, kind of that Super Nintendo era RPG kind of epic far-reaching world spanning kind of story and plot and everything I want to do that with this game 
because Jimmy the Nerd is going to be a big game. It's going to be an, it's going to still have kind of an epic scale to it, but it's going to be confined to a geographical area. This one, I want you to actually be able to travel through the world a bit more. So, kind of. Final Fantasy with some of the hack and slash uh, dungeon crawler type stuff from like a Zelda game, and the the puzzles. Uh, there will there will be puzzles. You know, kind of go back to the the classics sort of a thing. And I've already got the basic plot uh, written down and where it's gonna go. Right now, I'm just getting started on the beginning of the game and mapping everything in to start the game, and I'm going to be doing the enemies and getting all that, that stuff in the database, and, you know, it'll take some time to get done, but once it's once it gets there, I think it'll be a really good game. And for everyone who's a fan of those classic Super Nintendo era RPGs, I think you'll find that what I have in mind, I think, will be very satisfying. You know, it's still going to have some goofiness, it's still going to be the comedy, because that's just my style. I like to work comedy in, but there will still be quite a bit of serious stuff going on. Bringing in some socio-political things like the human trafficking, some the social commentary about that in the form of Essia's people being enslaved for this war and all that sort of stuff. There will be elements of that in there. And, you know, like I said, once it's done, I think it'll be a really good game. And for everyone who's a fan of those classic Super Nintendo era games, hopefully you'll really enjoy it. And anybody who enjoys RPGs in general. Because, you know, I don't uh, settle on any one particular style. You're going to find elements of JRPGs and Western RPGs. Like, my way of doing gear on this game is very kind of Dungeons and Dragons-esque. So you'll find elements of both in the way I work, because I've played both kinds of games and enjoyed both kinds of games, and they've both influenced me. So, thanks very much for watching. I'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye.